uh welcome back everybody to the san francisco dharma collective this is the dharma doors i'm mc owens and tonight's going to be part three of our our reading our study of the sutra on the magician bhadra the bhadra maya kara sutra <clears throat> um I'm going to start just with a kind of a quick recap of the story. This is one of those sutras that's, it's a, it's a narrative. There's a story that's going on here. And in order to kind of explain what has happened, uh, I just want to go back over what type of sutra this is. This, of course, is uh, one of those beautiful sutras from the Maharatna Kuta collection, that beautiful anthology or collection of 49 sutras and this is sutra number 21 of that collection and sunday nights and the dharma doors we've basically been going through the maharatna kuta collection and this is a fun one because it's one of these more narrative story driven kind of sutras very allegorical and just to recap the story so that we can get into the next chapter this sutra is about this magician here uh, named Bhadra. And the idea of this sutra was that Bhadra is a magician in Rajgriha, this city where the Buddha is dwelling. And the magician Bhadra has this plan to deceive the Buddha. And so part of this plan is to invite the Buddha to a, a Dharma feast. Um, but the idea here is, is that the magician Bhadra is gonna kind of pull one over on the Buddha, on the Tathagata, and invite him to the lowest, dirtiest place of Rajgriha, where he has constructed a, a site of enlightenment, what uh, last week we were calling a dojo, where the Japanese get the word dojo from. And that was the, the magician Bhadra's big plan. Of course, all the while, <laughs> the Tathagata, the Buddha knows exactly what's going on. And the idea is, is that I wanna just start with uh, one of the things that happened last week that was very exciting, or it was a big turning point in the narrative, was that the magician Bhadra goes to the lowliest, filthiest place in, in Rajgriha and magically conjures up a pavilion, a kind of a canopy and a stage and this area with all these embellishments and adornments. And he's doing all of this to deceive the Buddha in that sense. But then these four great heavenly kings, these four great heavenly beings show up and say, wow, you're honoring the Buddha. You're building this beautiful pavilion for the Buddha. We want to do that too. And so they, the four great heavenly kings, build their own offering of a dojo or site of enlightenment for the Buddha. And then Chakra Devanam Indra, the god of the sky, comes and says, wow, you're, you're all <laughs> celebrating the Buddha. You're all celebrating the Tathagata. I too want to celebrate the Tathagata. And so Indra builds an even better, beautiful, more adorned uh, pavilion uh, for the Buddha. At which point this magician Bhadra is very concerned because he feels like he's kind of uh, it had been trapped in some way. And so he actually tries to withdraw his magical creation. And for the first time, he says he can't undo his magic. And that's when Chakra Devanam Indra explains to him that, well, that's because all of his effort, all of his building of this magical pavilion it was all an offering to the Tathagata, to the Buddha, and he can't take that back. And then that was sort of kind of the, the ironic twist to, the, the, to last, uh, last week, to this sort of second part of this. The ironic twist to this was that 
even though the magician Bajra's plan was to deceive the Buddha by creating this amazing dojo and doing all of this, it, it doesn't in a way, it, it, it almost kind of feels like no publicity is bad publicity when it comes to the Buddha in, the, in that way. And just a little side note on that idea, what was funny about this, of course, was that it says that everybody in Rajgriha came to the dojo, came to the site of enlightenment. And they either came because they wanted to see the Buddha get deceived, or they came because they wanted to see the, the Buddha perform great miracles. But sort of, again, as an ironic twist, everybody in Rajgriha has come to see the Buddha one way, one way or another, right? And so that was sort of the, the idea of last week or, or that twist in the story. Um, and then I, I wanted to kind of return to the story and kind of just finish up where we were last week, because as you can see here, basically our magician Bajra has been defeated. He, in, in last week, uh, the idea is that eventually uh, seeing this beautiful display of all the, of the four heavenly kings, seeing the heavenly display of Chakra Devanam Indra, seeing all of this, the magician Bhadra, it says, cast away his arrogance, cast away his pride. And he approached the Buddha, prostrated himself at the Buddha's feet and said, world honored one, I now repent and confess my wrongdoing in the presence of the Tathagata. Blinded by ignorance, I have tried to deceive the Buddha by conjuring up various magnificent adornments. Although I now feel remorse, I cannot make my magical creations disappear. So that's the moment that's sort of being depicted here where Bhadra is sort of ad admitting defeat, okay? So insofar as this has been a retelling of the famous magic competition. And if you refer back to part one of this talk, I talked about how this sutra fits into a, it's kind of a, a genre of sutras or a genre of Buddhist folklore that's about the great magical competition. And I actually wanted to return to some ideas that I, I talked about in the first part, which was that this sutra it sort of assumes that you know a particular story already. And that story, which I talked about in part one, is called the miracle at Shravasti. And the miracle at Shravasti is a very old Buddhist story, maybe one of the first and original stories of the Buddha performing miracles. And this was also part of the, the original magic competition at Shravasti was a magic competition between the Buddha and these six heretics or heterodox teachers. So they are non-Buddhist teachers, they were magicians, and they challenged the Buddha to a, a duel of magic, a magic off. And at that competition, the main miraculous thing that happens is well, the main miraculous thing that happens is the Buddha shoots fire and water out of both sides of his body and then starts to create this kind of magical display. And in particular, in the, the miracle at Shravasti, what's really important about it is that in this uh, kind of miraculous display of fire and water, the Buddha manifests these images of himself, these Buddhas. Some are sitting, it says, some are laying down, some are standing, but it's, it's sort of this, um, uh, uh, this miracle of, well, what the, the Chinese have a really interesting term for it. It's called uh, uh, shen fun, 
or fun shun, sorry, mix those up. The fun shun splitting the body. It's one of the kind of the oldest miraculous magical tricks there is, which is the ability to be multiple places at one time. And then in this case, the ability to be many or be multiple at one time. So this is kind of a, a particular magic or form of miracle that the world has talked about a lot, the ability to be multiple places at once or to manifest multiple bodies. The Buddha does it in this original story of Shravasti, where within this, you know, I described it the first night as it, you know, this kind of rainbow display coming from the combination of these fire and water um, display. <laughs> it's kind of hard to describe. But the idea is, is there's these different Buddhas that are seen and, and the six different heretics, they all see these different Buddhas. Like that's kind of part of the story. I mentioned that, or I, I, I mentioned it again, because last week, what we talked about, we talked about it for a while. It was a big part of my mural. And that was the Buddha <clears throat> describes, <clears throat> excuse me, the Buddha describes that he has the, the, um, the control over these wind wheels, these giant uh, wind wheels that could actually like destroy a whole universe. And one of the things that he says, he says this to Madhuryayana, but in describing these wind wheels, he asks, he says, so what do you think? Can the magician Bhadra dwell securely in these wind wheels? And Madhuryayana says, no way. And the Buddha says to Madhuryayana, the Tathagata, the Buddha, can walk, stand, sit, and lie down undisturbed in these wind wheels. The Tathagata can also put those wind wheels into a mustard seed and all of that. But I, I wanted to pause really quickly on that idea that the Buddha can stand, sit, walk, or lie down in these wind wheels. So that's sort of a, a subtle reference to this miraculous display at Shravasti, where the Buddha is seen sitting, lying, standing, and, and in, in these kind of miraculous display. And then this happens again. Um, let's see, where does it happen again? Um, sorry about that. I have these notes. Ah, right. So this was the part. So the part I wanted to mention was, so Bajra builds his pavilion, then the four heavenly kings build their pavilion, and then Chakra builds his pavilion. And then what it says is at the end that the, then the Tathagata, the Buddha, by his miraculous powers, the Rid, Ridhi Bala, the, the miraculous powers, the Buddha caused the magician Bhadra, Chakra Devanam Indra, and the four great heavenly kings all to see the Buddha, the world honored one, simultaneously at each of the places that they had adorned. And so this is kind of an idea where Bajra's made his palace, four heavenly kings have made their palace, Chakra's made their palace, and Chakra thinks, ah, the Buddha came to my palace. The Buddha wanted to come to my palace. But the four heavenly kings see the Buddha in their palace and they think, no, the Buddha has come to our palace. Bajra, of course, thinks the Buddha has come to his palace. And that, of course, again, is a reference to this kind of fun shun or this splitting of the body appearing different uh, places with each person thinking that the Buddha is appearing uh, as the, as the sutras say, appearing face to face with them, right? So that, that's sort of the theme and it's that miracle 
again, that sort of really wows Badra, wows everybody. One of the things that I wanted to start with tonight, because it'll kind of ease us into that we have a, tonight's subject is kind of pretty heavy, actually. Um, and sort of to ease us into it, I want to start talking about this, um, these miraculous different bodies of the Buddha. And I want to use an interesting example of it. Um, if you've come to the Dharma doors, or you've studied with me, you know that we talk a lot about mm, things like phenomena, but in particular, um, I, fit, I talk a lot about phenomenology, which is this kind of, it's a, it's a kind of European modern philosophical trend, phenomenology. But if you're familiar with it, Buddhism is very phenomenological. And all that term means, if you're not used to that word, is the idea that each of us have our own mental images of this reality that come to us from our unique sensory organs, our unique mental configuration, and therefore there arises in us or in our minds the experience of phenomena but that the experience of a phenomena is going to be different for each individual person because we each have different eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodies, and ultimately differently conditioned or configured brains in that way. And so the, what you're seeing and experiencing is going to be totally different than what I'm seeing and experiencing. This is just phenomenology. But where Buddhism takes this interesting step is to sort of take very seriously each of our individual experiences and take away the idea of an absolute objective reality to which each of our individual experiences could be measured. And that's normally the way met metaphysics or normally the way physics functions in the world, certainly in the Western English speaking world, European as well, which is the idea that there's a really a world going on out there that we are all uniquely distorting, but there is an actual world out there versus just the phenomenological experience. This is where Buddhism takes a step in a slightly different direction than modern Western metaphysics or philosophy in that way. And of course, one beautiful way that I, I, I would like to demonstrate this to you is I know that you are all, you know, there, but here is a beautiful Buddha image that I'm sure is appearing uniquely to you, each of you. And I'm sure it is appearing face to face with each of you, even though you are all oriented differently, facing different directions in this multiverse in which we reside miraculously the buddha has appeared to you face to face directly and we have all just experienced a different buddha in that way this internet thing is a beautiful upaya for describing this type of of uh phenomenology in that way and so on that note just on that note of phenomena versus absolute reality what happens is is that the the main i would say it's the main um teaching yeah it's definitely the main teaching as we will see the main teaching of the sutra comes about and it's what we finished with last time so i want to start with it this time but the main teaching of the sutra is this idea that the magician bhadra is a classic magician in that he deals with illusions versus reality. So he's kind of tricking you with some illusions. And the idea is there's a absolute reality objectively in, in that sense. But then what he comes to realize in this, in this way is that the Buddha is this, the greatest magician and the Dharma is the greatest of magic because the world, so the world on one of the Buddha tells the magician Bhadra, 
all sentient beings and all material objects are illusory, like magic, conjured up by karma. All monks and nuns are also illusory like magic, but they're conjured up by the Dharma. The Buddha says that his body, he says, my body is illusory like magic, but it's conjured by wisdom. He says, the entire multifold, billionfold world universe is illusory, like magic, but conjured up by all sentient beings as a whole. And ultimately, all dharmas, all phenomena, all things are illusory, like magic, conjured up by combinations of causes and conditions. So... That was the last teaching, and that is the primary teaching of this sutra, which if you've read the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, or if you've read any of the Pranya Paramita Sutras, you know the essence of that teaching of Pranya, or transcendent wisdom. The essence of that teaching is that all dharmas, all phenomena are illusory, like magic, in that way. And, you know, I always run the risk of just spending all night talking about <laughs> this idea and, and not moving any further ahead in, in the sutra that way. I'm gonna uh, try to avoid doing that because the sutra speaks very well for itself. But if you kind of got what I was saying regarding no objective reality, <laughs> but each individual having their own individual experience because we are again, all conditioned differently in that way. And so each individual's experience is going to be their own kind of phenomena in that way. And where the illusion comes in, where the, the trick comes in, is assuming that my image of reality is just like everybody else's. In other words, mistaking a mentally derived phenomena for an, an object in space that you could go and grab, or you could be afraid of, or you could crave, or you could want. So perceiving of these things, these ideas, these phenomena, perceiving of them as being outside of our experience, outside of ourselves in that way, that's the illusion. Okay. So that's sort of the essence of what the the teaching as in the sutra. And then an interesting thing happens. So this is new territory. And if that's, if, if the illusion clear, I'm going to do my best to continue talking about it, but it's a deep idea. So, but when, as the sutra goes, the Buddha says, now in this pavilion, right? Now you should offer to all these people one by one, these beverages and food that you have produced by magic. Thereupon the magician Bhadra, the four Deva Kings, the four heavenly Kings and Chakra Devanam Indra, along with their retinues and all of their magically produced servants they all offered beverages and food to the Buddha and the Sangha. They provided fully for everyone in the assembly. Then Mahakashapya spoke in verse. Before I read Kashapya's poem, this is going to be the first of 11 poems and i'm hoping to get through these 11 poems they're not real they're gathas so just little four line poems and there's 11 of them and i'm hoping to get through all of them tonight we'll see how it goes but what's about to happen is is that five let's see i drew them over here five bhikshus shravakas uh the these five senior monks are about to each give a, uh, a little gatha, a mind verse or a, a, a poem. 
then there's going to be five bodhisattvas that give gathas or mind verses. And I want to say this now, just in case I don't say it later, but we're going to notice kind of a shift where what the monks are discoursing about and what the bodhisattvas are discoursing about are going to be of a slightly different order, right? And then finally, there's going to be the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri, who will sort of summarize the whole thing. So those are these 11 poems that I want to focus on tonight. And I just wanted to say this too. If you've read the Vimalakirti Sutra, which this is very similar to the Vimalakirti Sutra in a lot of ways, there's something beautiful going on here with this sutra. And I've, I've tried my best. I, I, I'm not actually in any way an uh, artist in this sense. So I, I struggle with these murals and, you know, struggle with perspective and those things. But I definitely wanted to kind of tr try to create the sense that we are now inside of those pavilions. I wanted to really bring us inside this world that has been magically created by Bhadra. Right. That was that's sort of my intention with these uh, murals. I'm, I, I mentioned this in the first session that I am kind of participating in a very old Buddhist tradition of storytelling here. And when I say that, what I mean is, is that at this point in the sutra, it would be it would be probably beneficial and helpful to not hold the sutra too far away in that the, 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 the feast is about to happen in that sense. And what I mean is, is that when, when the sutra says that these four heavenly kings and chakra have magically produced servants to start serving us food, this is a Dharma feast. So we're about to feast on wisdom and knowledge and Maha Kashyapya is the first to serve it up as it were, right? So I just wanted you to right, kind of be very fully aware that there's a very interesting form of, I don't, it wouldn't quite be called recursion, but it's a kind of interesting form of inclusion um, that, you know, maybe there's like literary scholars out there that can tell me, but the, the closest that I've found to this is the never ending story. So Michael Ende's never ending story, where the reader becomes sucked into the very story that they're reading. That's what's happening here. So this is very much in that tradition. And now we're about to get into some serious Dharma. So then Mahakashyapya spoke in verse. <clears throat> um, let's see. Knowing that food is illusory and likewise are its recipients. When these things are in equanimity, this is called pure giving. That's going to be the first gatha that we're going to talk about. Food is illusory, also are its recipients. When these things are seen in equality or in equanimity, this is pure giving. Vimaladana, Sudhidana, I'm not quite sure what the Sanskrit originally would have been in, but this idea of pure giving. So this begins a very classic um, treatment of the idea of giving, dana generosity each of the each of these poems is actually about generosity in that way <clears throat> or at least the first five are explicitly about giving and this practice of giving is called dana generosity and what's being sort of articulated here is a very classic idea about the bodhisattva path which is that the bodhisattva does not distinguish between gift, giver, and recipient. 
It's a very, very classic kind of formula for the Bodhisattva path that in the practice of giving, in the practice of generosity, the Bodhisattva does not distinguish between the gift, the giver of the gift, and the receiver of the gift. And that is considered pure giving. All right. Now, this is, of course, Mahakashyapya's version of that, where he's talking about food is illusory and the person who eats the food is illusory. When those two things are seen in equanimity, this is called pure giving. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the, the Gatha there, but that's the basic point of it. And, you know, this is really interesting for a lot of different reasons. The idea here is, is that there's a form of giving that is sort of an old school, uh, early Buddhist form of giving. And that was in the form of actual um, giving of, of food, which is what Kashapya is, is referencing here. Or maybe it's the giving of clothing, or maybe it's the giving of medicine, but food, clothing, and medicine were the traditional three gifts that one could give to a Buddhist, to a monk, or a nun. And in exchange for that, there was understood in, in early Buddhism, there was understood to be a kind of karmic exchange for that. In exchange for the generosity and the giving of the gift, the giver got punya, got merit. So gift, giver, recipient. And then in exchange for the giving, one gets punya. And I want to make it clear that this sutra and the whole Mahayana tradition is not saying that there's anything wrong with giving in that way. It's suggesting, however, that there is a, a greater form of giving, a, a higher form of giving. And that is the bodhisattva form of giving in which the gift, the giver, and the recipient, there's no distinguishing between those three. And, you know, there's a lot to that, both like practically and metaphysically. <laughs> practically speaking, you know, I would probably suggest that you read uh, some Nietzsche, because Friedrich Nietzsche, that German philosopher from the late, uh, uh, you know, 1900s, he was really on to something regarding, well, he railed against the Catholic Church and against Christians for, for Christian pity, basically. And this idea of like giving to the poor. And he really had a problem with the idea of like the wealthy or the elite giving to the poor as a means of staying elite and as a means of keeping people as poor people. And he, he detected a, a great degree of hypocrisy, especially when this is coming from like a, a Christian tradition. And he's not the only person to detect this hypocrisy in giving or the potential hypocrisy in giving, <clears throat> but it's kind of a thing that happens. And then eventually anthropologists go on to write uh, treatises about uh, the nature of the gift. I'm referring to Marcel Mauss's favorite, uh, famous anthropology called The Gift which is a critique of the idea of gift giving in which any form of gift giving actually creates a form of debt, where if I give you a gift, you are now indebted to me in some way. And then that'll socially have to be kind of worked out. And, you know, of course, again, practically speaking, that is a, that kind of is a thing that happens in a way, you know, even thinking about, um, uh, 501c3s and tax donations and things like that and people giving to get their tax donation and all of that. So, but again, I don't want to throw any form of giving under the bus. Generosity is generosity. Giving is giving, right? And I, you know, that's that. But this bodhisattva is engaged in a kind of a much deeper level of generosity or giving where they're participating in the same generosity or the same acts of giving, but the mentality involved in it is this kind of, you know, contemplation or this sort of um, 
uh, Vipassana, frankly, a kind of insight about recognizing no distinction between gift giver and recipient in that way. Now, Mahakashapya has taken it to that level of saying that there, that food is illusory, so as are the recipients. When these things are viewed in equanimity, it says that is called pure giving. And so that's the idea is that, again, any form of giving is going to be good, but a form of giving that doesn't distinguish between the gift giver and recipient is going to be considered vimala dana, or this kind of pure giving. And you know, without going too into it, because I do want to go through the various poems that are all on this theme, it really does come down to a kind of egoless generosity, where the act of giving is not in any way done with the sense of, oh, I'm such a good person, I gave such and such to somebody, or even I gave some thing to somebody, all of that is going to be, um, you know, in a way, not how the Bodhisattva is trying to think of this in that way. What'd you got, Eric? Eric, where'd you go? Yeah, I was thinking of equanimity and seeing things as equally as an illusion. They are, they are all equally illusory. In that, that, is, way. that is indeed the, the deeper teaching. Eric, that at that prana level, which is to say that phenomenological level I was talking about, all phenomena are phenomena. <laughs> all things are equally phenomena in that sense. And as I often like to say, you know, the idea of a ball of lint and the idea of a planet they weigh the same, they're the same size. In fact, they're equally ideas. Even though you would like to think that a ball of lint is a little smaller than a planet, but once they are in the realm of ideas, they are equalized as ideas. And that's kind of a, you know, uh, a not so fun way to talk about all dharmas being illusory. In that sense, it's much funner to talk about all dharmas as being like magic or being like illusions in that way. But absolutely, Eric, that is the fundamental teaching here is that when the bodhisattva or, you know, if the bodhisattva can view all phenomena as equally illusory, it's kind of an express route to opeksha. It's an express route to equanimity in that way. When you can really truly see the illusory nature of all dharmas in that sense. Yeah. All right, let's read Maguyayana. Mahamadguyayana is the next up. Um, the, the monks, the five uh, Shravaka, Shravakas, they all have a very similar type of poem. So Mahamadguyayana said, knowing that seats are illusory, and those who sit upon them as well. When these are seen in equality or in equanimity, this is called pure giving. So Kashapya was referring to the food which is being offered to everybody in the audience, everybody in the assembly. And Kashapya is saying food is illusory and the people that receive food are both illusory. And when those are seen in equanimity, that is called pure giving. Next up are the very seats that everyone is sitting on while they eat their food in that way. And Maguyana says that the seats are illusory and so too are those who sit upon them. When those are seen in equanimity, that is called pure giving. Very, very similar idea. Um, and I think I'm not even going to dwell on that one too long because it's so similar. Unless anybody has deep interest in the illusory nature of seats, right? And yes, there's a lot of references that could be made to that. But the third Shravaka to step up is Shariputra. 
And Shariputra says, just like these illusory servants, so too are the minds of the receivers. When one is able to give thusly, to give like that, then this is called pure giving. Okay, so really quickly, I wanted to, to say this right away. So the four heavenly kings and Chakra Devanam Indra, they have magically produced all this food as well as servants to serve it. And before anybody kind of goes running off, worried about connotations of slavery or anything like that, there is no need to go running off. <laughs> if you have ever been to a restaurant, you have been served, you've been waited upon. And that is what is being referred to here. Um, I'm not gonna kind of say that there, you won't find traces of indentured servitude in, in Buddhist history in that way. But as it pertains to what's going on in this scenario, these servants should very much be understood as waiters, like you would encounter in a restaurant. And the reason why I want to make this point is not so much to like save Buddhism from any, you know, political incorrectness. It's not my, uh, not my point at all. I actually, what I want to do is, is make this particular teaching applicable to our lives Again, in that if you've ever been to a restaurant and have been waited upon and served, then this little poem is for you <laughs> in the sense that Shariputra is saying is that Latin, next time you go to the Olive Garden or wherever you go, the servants and the waiters are all illusory, as are the minds of the, of the receivers. So... This is not saying, you know, that the the weight, the help doesn't exist. <laughs> this is saying that the minds of those being waited upon do not exist either. So in that grand tradition of equanimity, everything is illusory here. Nothing escapes this kind of teaching of being illusory. Now, that teaching about the illusory nature of the minds of the receivers, that's a, that's a pretty heavy statement there, right? How could we possibly understand that? You know? I mean, basically, I think there's a very, uh, there's, again, there's sort of a, a real heavy dharmic metaphysical way to think about this. And there's kind of actually a practical, very simple way to think about this. One of the ways that our minds in that sense, the minds of these receivers or your mind or my mind, one of the ways in which the Buddha often speaks of them as being that our minds are, are, um, well, it's certainly illusory, but another, another way to put it is um, unobtainable. That would be a classic Buddhist way of saying that the mind cannot be obtained. You can't grab it. It has no color. It has no smell. It has no shape. You cannot put it into a bottle. There is a way, very much a way in which this very mind in which you are hearing me and thinking about what I'm talking about, there's a way in which it is absolutely unobtainable and illusory. It is nowhere at all, if only for its ever-changing nature. If only for that. Are you, you're with me now. What happened five minutes ago is gone. This is the new mind. This is the new you in that way, right? And the idea is, is that with all changes and fluctuations in thought, the mind can, the mind, where, what mind, where, when, which, which version of this one? Oh, wait. So just that alone, like if you really just sort of think about the nature of mind for a moment, it's completely unobtainable. It's completely illusory in that way, let alone in the dependently originated 
emptiness way, right? So there's a variety of ways to understand this statement that the servants are illusory and so too are the minds of the waited upon, right? All right, questions, comments, answers, ideas about those? We feeling okay? Cool. Next up is Subuti. So Subuti's poem reads this, not giving for the sake of giving, nor receiving for the sake of receiving. When one is able to give thusly, then this is called pure giving. <laughs> It's an interesting exercise, right? To even just con for forget about actually going out in the world and doing it, right? Like actually going out in the world and practicing giving without distinguishing between the gift, the giver, and the recipient. That's, that's one thing, right? But to even contemplate this idea of like, what would that mean or look like? To give, what, what did he say, right? Not giving for the sake of giving, not receiving for the sake of receiving, right? When one is able to give like that, that's called pure giving. Now, I definitely would refer again back to Nietzsche's uh, crit criticism of uh, pity, basically, is what he calls it, the problem of pity, of pitying people, right? It's a classic way to elevate oneself over others is pitying them. It's subtle though, because it seems like, um, um, it seems like kindness in a way, but it's, it's tricky. And so this is the antidote to that, of course, giving without any idea of giving, right? Or giving, not giving for the sake of giving, not receiving for the sake of receiving. Again, I, I, there's sort of two different ways to even do this, to think about it and then to actually go out in the world and do this, to actually practice this is one thing, but to even think about what that would mean. Like, you know, I mean, one, one way to think about it as a stepping stone, this goes deep, it goes so deep, but if you wanted just a, a step in the right direction, You know, think about somebody who, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm really making this up, but it, again, and this is just a step in the right direction, but it's like, you know, think about somebody who grows, grows a bunch of fruit, right? Um, and they have a bunch sitting around that's just going to rot. And so they go around giving it away. There's a way in which they might be doing that actually selfishly in that they don't want all this rotting uh, food around their house, right? Now it's great for people who, who want that fruit or want that food, right? So it's giving, but there would be a way, and again, this is just a stepping stone. This is not the end at all, but there's a way in which, so there's this person with all this fruit and goes giving it to all these people, but they're the ones that think that they, that they won like in that way. But then the people who got all the fruit, they think they won because they just got a bunch of free fruit. So yeah, it's kind of like a win-win situation there where everybody thinks that they kind of won in that way. And especially for somebody who maybe has an abundance of extra fruit in that sense, they, they might not be clinging to it like gold where they feel like, well, this is such a valuable object. And so if I give this to somebody, I'm really a nice person because this is so valuable and I have relinquished it and given it to somebody. But if there's sort of just a, a more of a um, looking at something as almost like an energetic exchange in which there's no telling who was the benefactor, no telling who, you know, in that way, that's again, a stepping stone to thinking about a way in which giving can happen without a gift giver or recipient, right? Because again, there's a way in which that person with the extra food, 
or extra fruit, they might think that they were the ones that got something out of that deal, if you know what I mean. And so again, gift, who's the giver? Who's the recipient? What is being given to whom? When you can really kind of put your Dharma hat on and, and start breaking those ideas down, the gift giver recipient kind of idea, that's sort of what this is, um, it's what this is talking about, All right? Okay, so those are our four uh, Shravakas and now our fifth Shravaka, Ananda. It's always the young Ananda, the Buddha's young cousin coming in at the end. What is given is like empty space and the one who receives cannot be grasped, not attached to body or mind. This kind of giving is the most clear and pure. All right, so that's Ananda. Ananda is kind of putting a, um, you know, um, finishing off the Shravakas with this grand statement, right? That what is given is like empty space, like Akasha. And the one who receives that Akasha, <laughs> the one who receives that cannot be grasped. Not attached, being not attached to bodies or minds, or the body or mind, this giving is the most clear and pure. So I've already sort of mentioned a few of those ideas. <clears throat> I spoke about the ungraspability of the mind. Here, Ananda speaking about the ungraspability of the receiver. Again, you know, you could really. Uh, spend all night just talking about that idea, of course, because that would be completely linked to the idea of anatman, no atman, no self, the ungraspability of the receiver. Which receiver? Who, which, you know, which version of the receiver in which skanda configuration kind of an idea, right? And then, of course, the space like or empty like nature of the gift itself. So these are themes that I've, you know, mentioned several times. So I feel like they should be pretty clear. Let's get to the bodhisattvas. So this is, this is a classic um, um, setup, if you will, where these five, they're, they're often actually in a sutra like this called Mahashravakas, great voice hearers, because the things that, that Ananda and Shabuti and Shariputra and Kashapya Maguyana, the things that they just said are very enlightened, like Mahayana enlightened. But of course, within the Mahayana tradition, Shravakas are always going to be a little down here in their understanding, and the Bodhisattvas are going to um, kick it up a notch. <laughs> and so, um, this is our first Bodhisattva, and I believe. Uh, yeah, he was referenced at some point, but it's a bodhisattva named Light Banner. So uh, this Prabhadavaja, maybe something like that, Light Banner Bodhisattva said, by analogy, just as that magician Bhajra created magically adorned things, all dharmas are also such as these, yet foolish people are unaware of it. So Light Banner Bodhisattva has re-articulated the theme of the sutra that all dharmas are illusory like magic, right? And he said that by analogy, just as this magician has created, has created all these magically adorned things, all dharmas are also like this. You know, this is the teaching. This is the teaching of the Mahayana. I've tried to this evening put it in the context of phenomenology because I think that that's understandable, like as, as a way of understanding this, that if you really do take into consideration that 
we each uniquely have our own mental experience of what's going on. If only, if only because of our vantage point, if only because of that, let alone the fact that I have different eyes that might have different rods and cones that are producing different visual phenomena, forget that I might have different ears that are distorting sounds to create different sensory experiences, forget that I have a different history than you with different relationships to things so that when something happens, I feel differently about it. I have a different reaction to it. So this all culminates in me having a different experience, but it, it starts with the fact that I'm literally only my angle on reality. And, and even if you were in the same room with me, you would be having a different literal visual angle, which would change your experience. Again, not to mention the fact that you have different sensory organs with, that are totally configured differently and an entirely different history than mine so that your relationship to these things are different. So that teaching that these things that we're experiencing are very, very intimately, uniquely our own. Everything you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking about is very intimately and uniquely your own version of it. And in that way, there is a tremendous amount to learn from our experience, from why we're having the experience we're having. But we become those foolish people that are unaware of this. We become that when we assume that what I'm experiencing is the exact same thing and everybody is, should be experiencing the same thing too. And of course, as soon as we make that assumption that there's the same thing out there for everybody, we could get into arguments and fights <laughs> and wars about that if we were so delusional as to think that there was that objective reality out there. But if we actually come to this dharmic understanding and respect that we are all uniquely having our own experience, and, and then in particular from a suffering point of view, that we are all struggling in that sense with our own unique experience, that's what the bodhisattvas are talking about in that way. And again, that's just at this phenomenological level that I've decided to, to go on tonight not even the dependent origination level, which I have talked about in the past, but chose not to tonight because it's a big can of worms, right? But if you know about it, that's also the, what is the magically produced nature of all dharmas is that they are all dependently originated. All right. Everybody ready for another Bodhisattva? Can I ask a question? Yeah, no, please. Um, it seems like there are two levels here of thinking about the uh, dharmas are illusory. One is uh, that, yeah, well, when we look at that mural, we each see something different because of our rods and cones and conditioning, et cetera. And the other is that, but 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 that there's actually a mural there that's like out there and separate. And if somehow we could see it without any of these taints, there would be an it to see. And then the other is that there is no it to see, or rather there is no way to see it untainted, that it doesn't exist untainted. Like it exists, but it doesn't exist without a seer. <laughs> or, or is that getting into dependent origination? I was just about to say, you've thrown that dependent origination lure. You've yeah. thrown that lure out there. And you're like, come on, Michael. I really <laughs> well, want you, you to. But you've been saying that. You've been saying that. But it's. No, no, no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yes. that Where this gets tricky, even phenomenologically, is that when I say that we will all, all be having a unique different experience of, uh, like Noam's example of this mural, I've posited the existence of the mural that we are all then going to have a different experience of. Yes, you caught me. You caught me already. 
And that's where the dependent origination then comes from and why that is the true magic. And it's actually the true magic of, of um, all of the, the poems of the Shravakas that are talking about the illusory nature of food, the illusory nature of the recipients. It actually has to do with Noam's question. It has to do with, but what about that original whatever it was that was prompting us to, to then come up with these illusory uh, magical ideas in that way? And that, of course, is this idea that, oh, yeah, I mean, that's the dependent origination that we've talked about. That, I mean, it's, it's tricky. And it's tricky because of the, um, can, is there a bodhisattva that can get me out of this? <laughs> um, let me read the next bodhisattva because I think my attempt to explain that one, I could work it in, I could work my answer better into just doing that. So let's keep going. So the bodhisattva light adornment says the seats as well as the trees are all illusions of the mind of such illusions at, of such illusions and empty space, how could there be any distinction? Or let's read it a slightly different way, or actually read a different version just to have a slight difference. Uh, seats and trees are all produced magically by an illusory mind. What difference could there be between an illusory mind and empty space? All right, so let's deal with that. So this Bodhisattva light adornment, he begins his poem with the seats and the trees are all illusions of the mind. Okay, so let's start there. And I think actually, yeah. And then he says, what difference could there be between an illusory mind and empty space? <laughs> so, I'm going to walk you really quickly through this. I think it's, it would be a great um, way or attempt to answer Gnome. So let me grab a friend here. So um, here we go. I'm not going to use, I'm not going to talk about seats. I'm not going about trees, but I'm going to use an example to walk us through this, which is this idea. So I'm going to employ my good old friend, this one here. So if you remember my friend, the idea here is, is that um, this, let's say this is also a, uh, a, a, someone has come to the Dharma feast here. And of course, in seeing that, you might think, oh, a duck came to the Dharma feast. But you then also might think a rabbit came to the Dharma feast. The question, of course, of, well, which is it? Is it a duck or a rabbit <clears throat> is the wrong answer or is the wrong question to be asking. It is neither a duck nor a rabbit. But depending on the conditioning of the mind, it may appear as a duck or it may appear as a rabbit. Depending on the conditioning of the mind, it may appear as food. It may appear as a seat. It may appear as a tree. So that's sort of pointing to the seats as well as the trees are illusions of the mind. The ducks and the rabbits and all of the other things are illusions of the mind. I know it's tempting to think that there's a rabbit or a duck out here, but the only rabbit or the only duck is going to be in your conditioned mind that is kind of programmed or conditioned to see certain forms or figures in certain ways. And this is going to go deeper and deeper and deeper to the point where you actually think it's food because you think you have a mouth, but you think you have mouth because you think it's food. And it's going to be the same kind of illusion in that same way. Although I know that this is a little easier to understand than the illusory nature of your mouth vis-a-vis -vis food. I, I understand that. 
but the idea remains the same, which is this. You might think this is a rabbit or a duck because it has the characteristics of a rabbit or a duck. It has rabbit ears or a duck bill. And then that is a characteristic that makes it that. So you, you, you're interpreting these things, these characteristics, and then coming to a de decision about what this is. You're interpreting these characteristics here and then coming to a decision about what you think this is. He, maybe human, maybe male, maybe this, maybe that. But the idea here is, is that all of this is equally mind produced in that way. And I know that when I, whenever I show you this example and you can toggle between the duck or the rabbit, the temptation is to toggle between this and, and what, Michael? Like, tell me the other thing. So then I would, and it's not quite like that. It's not as easy as toggling between Michael the human and Michael the alien or whatever. It's not about that. It's about these deeper ideas. I mentioned, um, I mentioned, I think last week or the week before, I forget when, but a, a really great example of this is about uh, like tallness and shortness. This was an example. I've been using this example a lot lately, but it's about the idea that if, if I were in one room and I was up here and there were all these people down here, right? You'd say, whoa, because Michael's a very tall guy. And like the tallness is a quality of, of me. But then if I were to go into another room that was full of these very, very tall people and I was the shorter person in the room, all of a sudden I'm short. But wait a minute, I thought I was tall. Like what happened to my tallness? I thought that was a characteristic that I possessed and that you could identify me, Michael, as the tall guy, right? But you're telling me that as soon as I go into a different room, I lose my tallness? How that, right? How, how is that? Oh, it must be that the, that the quality or the characteristic of being tall was never out, it was never here. It was truly in the eye of the beholder who was like, oh, look, that's the tall guy. And those are the short people. It was, oh, it was never, it, it was never owned or possessed by me, actually. If you can grok that, if you can capture right there how tall or short is in no way a characteristic or quality that can be possessed by an individual, it's always going to be relatively defined and it's always going to be in the eye of the beholder, not in the object. If you're following that logic that the characteristic of tallness is not here, then the characteristic of male is not here either. The characteristic of human is not here either. The characteristic of any of being a thing is not here either. It, 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 it could be, of course, just like you could conceive of me as tall, you could conceive of me as male, you could conceive of me as human, and you could conceive of me as an entity, a singular Michael. You could do that, but the Dharma or the Pranya, I should say the wisdom, is understanding that that is all in your mind, that it is, it's not out here. And yes, this is subject to the same process. I think I'm male, I think I'm human. And for the most part, six foot, yeah, I think I'm kind of, you know, generally understood as tall or whatever. So it goes, it's really wildly self-reflexive that way where it's happening out there where it's like, oh, look at that, that's so beautiful and that's tall and that's this and that's that. But then, then the way that we understand, quote, ourselves is in the same vein, if you will, where it's always going to be relative and ultimately in the eye of the beholder. And then this, of course, 
starts winding our way down to the beholder, right? Isn't that where we're getting to? Well, then who or what is the beholder of all of these illusions? Who is, what is the, the beholder that thinks these things about the world and themselves, right? Well, and that's kind of the root, truly kind of the root cause of the magic show in that sense. And I've, I've said this before, and I'll, get, I'll walk you through it and then we'll do another poem. It's very tempting to, to think we exist in that way. My, hi, Michael, nice to meet you, right? And the idea is I'm here existing, just being me, just being Michael. And you know what? I could, I, I'm thirsty. I, I'm gonna go grab my water bottle. And now I have my water bottle. It's tempting to think that I existed first, got thirsty and then reached for my water bottle. But what, we, what I've been trying to talk about the last few minutes is that it's actually upon the grasping of the idea of my water bottle that the very idea of me comes into existence to begin with. And it's not just my water bottle, it's my clothes, my body, my Dharma class, my whatever, my whatever. The very notions of, of possession in that way, of appropriation would be the word, the appropriation of these things. The idea of, of mind, this and that, it's the, the grand, all, all of the things that you are holding on to as yours are actually building up your sense of self in that way. And what is ultimately going on with all of these poems is about the illusory, vacuous, space-like nature of that self. It's so tenuous because it's actually being held up by all of that clinging <laughs> in that way. And so the Bodhisattva can say, the seats as well as the trees are all illusions of the mind. Of such illusions and empty space, what difference is there? Okay. Um, I think we could do this. So yeah, let's keep going. Then the Bodhisattva Simha, lion. Bodhisattva Simha said, the jackal who has never heard the roar of a lion will have a mind without fear, barking throughout the forest. But upon, <clears throat> but upon hearing the sound of a lion, he will hide and disappear. The magician Bajra was also like this before standing before the Tathagata, when he was with those of the outer paths, he would praise himself above the Buddha. Although the magician can create things, his techniques of magic are limited. However, the Tathagata's mastery of the techniques of magic are endless. All the devas and all maras are unable to know its limits. And, you know, this, this uh, sutra of Bajra the Magician, one of the things that it's been setting up since the beginning is how the magician Bajra, he does like low-level magic, low-level illusions, whereas the Tathagata, the Buddha, is the real magician. And I said this at the beginning, which is the idea is that Bajra is working within the realm of duality, the duality of... <clears throat> illusions, you know, and then reality. So there's the real world, the objective reality, and then there's these kind of the smoke and mirrors, you know, like an actual magic trick, <clears throat> like putting the sword through somebody or whatever it is, where it turns out that's not what really happened. It was just an illusion. 
the Bodhisattva Lion here, uh, their poem, it's about this idea that the Buddha and Buddhist magic or what have you is of a much higher order because it's talking about the illusory nature of everything, not just illusory versus real in that way. And that's, you know, that's, um, that's a much crazier form of magic. Let's just put it that way. It's a much wilder form of magic to be looking at all phenomena as a magic show in that sense, as one of the greatest magic shows. And so on that note of the superiority, shall we say, of the magic of the Tathagata, now, you know, this, so this is uh, Simhamati Bodhisattva, lion wisdom. And you might have noticed, or um, if you have the sutra, you might notice that the Bodhisattva lion has a very long poem. It's actually uh, like three times as long as everybody else's poem. And then this lion wisdom Bodhisattva pipes up. Now, is this the same Bodhisattva as a moment ago, but this is like the wisdom of the lion? It's not really clear. And it's of course, not really clear if these are supposed to be personages or ideas, but there does seem to be a connection between lion Bodhisattva and lion wisdom Bodhisattva. But lion wisdom Bodhisattva says, fully know that the servants, the drinks, the food, and those who eat are all magical transformations. This is supreme and virtuous giving. Um, that is certainly, um, I mean, the Bodhisattva's name, lion, that's true because that is the lion's roar. So that particular stanza is very much the lion's roar of this sutra. Again, that's the theme that uh, this idea that the servants, the food, in fact, everything are all magical transformations. And this is the supreme and virtuous giving. Um, before we get to the final couple of poems, I just wanna stop to make one really important point about this. the there's a kind of a much more practical message here that i haven't quite explicitly said so i would like to explicitly say this when it comes to this bodhisattva form of giving where it is equanimous and not distinguishing between gift giver and recipient in that way i think of a very practical way of thinking about this is on the one hand one of the things that happens in buddhist culture one of the things that seems to have happened in in um early buddhism was that you know basically there's this idea of what i outlined at the beginning a kind of karmic reciprocity when it comes to giving which is that if I were to give some food or clothing or medicine to a Buddhist monk or a nun, or let me just put it to you more bluntly, if I were to give food or clothing or medicine to a holy person, I would get punya. And the more holy, the more punya I get. So this is, an, this is something that happened in early Buddhism, that there was this kind of karmic equation that had to do with holiness and in the language of buddhism it was actually the language of purification the level of your sudhi sudhi meaning purification depending on how pure you were meaning how eradicated of the three poisons you were i.e how close to arhatship nirvana were you depending on how close to that were you were you were holy or pure and the more pure the more punya I would get. What starts to happen with that is, uh, I'll give you this, but what level of an arhat are you? Or like, what level are you? Okay. There actually seems to start to be in Buddhism this thing where 
either monks were only going to rich people's homes to beg or people were only giving to the, the, those that were deemed arhats because they would get more punya. And so again, while any form of generosity or giving is, is obviously better than hoarding and being selfish in that way, what this discourse is about is this very practical idea of giving indiscriminately, the value of giving indiscriminately. In particular, and the Bodhis, or was it the Bodhisattva who said it? No, it was Subhuti who said it. Not giving for the sake of giving, not receiving for the sake of receiving. That's pure giving. And so that idea of, you know, again, I could give to like a, a charity to get my tax return, or I could give to the charity and then put it on my Instagram and Twitter about how great a person I am because I gave away all my money or whatever. And again, not to say that that type of, all types of giving are great, but this is really celebrating a deep, genuine form of altruism, a deep, genuine, indiscriminate form of giving that not only do I, am I not discriminating and in particular judging who I'm giving to and being like, well, I don't know if you deserve my generosity. The Bodhisattva is never going to judge somebody as unworthy of the generosity. That's absurd from a bodhisattva point of view. And that's what this is sort of really extolling is this practice of bodhisattvas to give so indiscriminately that they're not even discriminating between the gift, the giver and the recipient in that way. So I just wanna make that clear that there is a really practical aspect to this it's not all emptiness and dependent origination there's an actual like place to operate from here which is this in indiscriminate giving and and starting to look at one's own behavior when it comes to giving and are you selective in who you are nice to are you selective in who you are kind to are you selective in who you give attention to in that way and the idea is that all of that are forms of giving right? Giving in terms of kind speech or giving in terms of attention. And so it's just one of those things to look at. And on that note, the Bodhisattva Maitreya, the future Buddha, in fact, adds to the Bodhisattva lion and lion wisdom by saying, just as when ghee, purified butter, is added to a fire, it spreads and flares up abundantly. When the Bhagavan, the world honored one, is compared to the magician Vajra, his magical transformations are also so. So lovely little analogy there. <clears throat> and then finally, Manjushri, the crown prince of the Dharma, comes in at the 11th position here and says, the multitude of good deeds at this assembly have never before come into being. All dharmas are entirely this way, always similar to what has passed. Leave it to the Bodhisattva Manju Shri to say something very heavy and wild right at the end, right? So, I've been, I've been really sitting on this one all week. I, I read these poems pretty much uh, right at the end uh, last week to get ready for this week. And this final statement of Manju Shri, right? So the multitude of good deeds performed at this assembly have never come into being. All dharmas are entirely this way, always similar to what has passed. It, it, it's, a, it's a heavy idea. It's a very, very heavy idea, but it's, you know, if I understand uh, what the Bodhisattva Manjushri said, and this will just sort of be the idea to finish this out for the evening. It's this idea of like reflecting upon the, the, um, I would say, I would use the Buddhist language of ungraspability of the past, 
that the past is entirely ungraspable. You, it is intangible. It cannot be held. It is truly idea only in that way. If you were to show me a picture of the past, that would be a picture that exists in the present. That's not the past. That's a present picture in that way. So when we are thinking about the actual past and thinking about its, oh, I don't know, let's call it its nature. What is the past made out of, right? Is it made out of atoms? Is it made out of particles and molecules? What exactly is the past made out of and what is it, right? Well, Manjushri's really heavy thing at the end is saying that you could regard all dharmas, all phenomena that you might presently be experiencing. The Bodhisattva views all dharmas as being like objects from the past in that way. Completely ungraspable, entirely mind made in that sense, and ultimately not made of atoms and particles and molecules, although those, although those might be part of the magical illusion, right? <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm happy that we got through those poems. By the way, this is not a short sutra. So this is not by no means the end of the sutra. We have just uh, kind of finished the, the magic competition proper. And the magician Bajra has been defeated by the Buddha. <laughs> okay. Any last questions, comments, answers, ideas? About magic, illusory dharmas. <laughs> does does magic always play the role of sort of pointing to the illusory nature of everything in in, in sutras? Yes. That, that's kind of its role, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. My feeling, my honest feeling about the original miracle at Shravasti, where the Buddha appeared multiple and defeated all the different heretics, whenever I read that particular story, I have to admit, I, I it, it it has a certain Spartacus thing to it. This, so if you're familiar with this idea of I am Spartacus, no, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. And all of these uh, Roman uh, slaves, Ro Roman soldiers standing up and saying, I am Spartacus. That moment where Spartacus truly becomes uh, legion in, to use the phrase, but multiple in that sense, there might be a thing going on like that where all these arhats kind of stood up and assumed the role of the Buddha and defeated the, uh, the, all the different heretics or something like that. I'm not sure. I just wanted to share that as a possibility because as you, when you read those stories, it, it kind of gives a hint that that might be what's happening there. The only reason why I say that is because in the early stories of that, it's always coupled with this, um, all of the different shravakas, all of the uh, kashapya madguyayana, they always say, let me, let me go battle them for you. And the Buddha says, no, 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 I'll do it. And they all step up and say, let me do it for you. So then when it actually happens and the Buddha is multiple, I just have a slight funny feeling about that. But yes, no, when it comes to Mahayana Sutras, it's always going to be a reference to this actual uh, magic of dependent origination, frankly. So, all right. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, stay tuned. Look forward to seeing you next week.